Hello and welcome to this Australian Biocommons webinar. My name is Melissa Burke and I'm the Australian Biocommons Training and Communications Officer and I'll also be your host for this webinar. In these webinars, we share useful information about the latest digital techniques, data and tools available to the life sciences community. Each month, we hear from our national and international peers on a bioinformatics topic that we hope will help you achieve your best medical, agricultural and environmental research. You can keep up to date with the latest Biocommons news and events by following us on Twitter or subscribing to our newsletter. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners and the custodianship of the lands on which we meet today. In my case, this is the Turrbal and Yagara people. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cult cultural and spiritual connections to country. And we recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Today, we're joined by Dr. Nandan Deshpande and Sarah, Dr. Sarah B. Croft, who will speak to us on the topic of portable, reproducible, and scalable bioinformatics workflows using Nextflow and Pawsey Nimbus Cloud. Nandan is a senior research bioinformatician at the Sydney Informatics Hub, and he has a PhD in bioinformatics, specializing in projects revolving around omics technologies. At the Sydney Informatics Hub, he consults with a variety of researchers and research groups to help them solve their questions in human diseases and host pathogen interactions. Sarah is part of the supercomputing applications team at the Pawsey Supercomputing Research Centre. Her role is to support bioinformatics users through workflow development and optimization, training and advocacy. Sarah has a PhD in medicine with a focus on computational genetics. We're also joined by Nandan's colleagues today, Dr. Tracy Chu and Dr. Jo Georgina Samaha, who are on hand to help answer your questions. Welcome to the webinar, Nandan and Sarah, and I'll now hand over to you for your presentation. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Nandan Deshpande and I work with the Sydney Informatics Hub. So today we'll be talking about portable, reproducible and scalable bioinformatic workflows using Nextflow. And uh, I work at the Sydney Informatics Hub and we work in close collaboration with Australian Biocommons. So what's in this section? I will be presenting in the first half of the section and I will talk about how complicated, complex the bioinformatics workflows can become and how in such a case workflow management systems can help. And then we'll be specifically jumping into talking about Nextflow as a workflow manager. So what we see on the left hand side is a very typical bioinformatic workflow, which is uh, that of a RNA-seq uh, analysis, uh, identifying differential expression genes. Uh, I'm, I'm almost sure that some of you would have actually had a chance to work with RNA-seq. And what we do is very, uh, it looks from this block diagram on the left hand side. Let me, let me do my pointer to laser pointer. Yeah. So what you can see on the left hand side are a clear cut demarcation between the different steps. You can go from library preparation, you can then sequence your reads, say Illumina, uh, you check the quality of the read streaming and then check the quality again to see if the trimming has helped and do the alignment of the reads to the reference genome, get your read counts and do differential expression analysis. Looks very simple, right? But when it actually goes to uh, trying to work with your own data sets, which comprise of huge data sets, huge samples, a lot of read depth, it doesn't look so uh, simplistic. It becomes much more complicated as you, as you can see on the right hand side. And that's a realistic uh, actually uh, representation of what happens on the background. So what are the bioinformatic workflows? They are multi-step methods that are performed to process or analyze your data. They often comprise of a lot of uh, different independent tools. When I say independent, as you can imagine, those tools have been developed by people like you and me who have actually worked in research labs and done things for their PhD or uh, otherwise. And those tools have been developed in different programming languages with different versions of the tool. So there could be possible issues with tool installations, incompatibilities, there could be dependency problems and version related errors. So all that taken into account, it becomes a sort of a very uh, detailed and very painstaking job to put a pipeline into place in uh, say for working with uh, scripts in bash or Python or whatever language you work with. To add on top of that, uh, the bioinformatics field is uh, encumbered with large amount, large size data sets with a lot of samples for getting statistical relevance. And when we try to run such pipelines, which are already generated using bash scripts, 
they could end up generating a lot of hundreds of intermediate small files. So it is a necessity and it is not like a luxury to try to optimize these pipelines because think about it, uh, when you run these pipelines made be on a local machine or if you uh, most probably want to run your bioinformatics pipelines on say national computing infrastructures or high processing computers, uh, the resources don't really come cheap. Even if you don't end up paying upfront, which you do when you try to work for, with things like Amazon Cloud or something, uh, even if you work on a national computing infrastructure, you have to actually apply for those resources. Uh, they are not really abundant. You need to really work with what you have. So you need, uh, there's a requirement that you actually optimize how you run your pipelines. And all that uh, leads to something called workflow management system, which will come in a moment. Before that, I wanted to sort of uh, put by you the experiences, what you possibly could have had uh, for uh, reproducing your scientific results. There could be three different scenarios when you try to run your own pipelines after a gap of some months or years or something. I happened to do that one, once upon a time and I thought I had actually created a very good pipeline and went back to the, the same machine which I, I had the pipeline on, it just wouldn't run. Something had happened, the, the programs changed or the versions changed, some kind of updation happened on the system which I was not in control of, whatever happened, it didn't run. I had to really uh, spend a lot of time more to actually make the pipeline run. Secondly, how comfortable you are to say uh, suddenly uh, a very excited collaborator of yours saying, okay, your result looks so good, you have put in so much time for the pipeline, can you can I borrow it? Uh, I was comfortable till the time he said that it doesn't work for him on his own machine. Uh, thirdly, is very crucial when you actually submit a manuscript for a peer review. Most of the time you get away with trying to uh, share your code on GitHub, for example. There comes a very excited, very enthusiastic, but very critical reviewer who is a bioinformatician who wants to really try out your pipeline saying, I believe in your data, but I want to see it with my own eyes. He wants to read on the pipeline. How comfortable you would be. I, I, I didn't used to feel that comfort. I don't know whether it worked for me. I don't want to go there. Uh, that led to a lot of people trying to assess uh, one of the requirements of uh, uh, developing uh, a good pipeline. Uh, that is the reproducibility. A lot of efforts have been done for quantitatively reproducing a pipeline. And this is one of the papers which I found, which is very uh, interesting, which says quantifying reproducibility in computational biology. Uh, they've taken a particular case of tuberculosis drug home. It took them almost like two months to reproduce the pipeline, the data which was analyzed. And that doesn't seem like a, a lot of time to be put for rerunning something. Uh, not only call it quantitatively, there have been qualitative assessments of uh, on the basis of reproducibility which were done. As you can see in the pie chart uh, on the uh, top row out here, you can see that the, the three circles represent the same pipelines, exactly same tools which have been run, but they have been run on different scenarios. First has been run with a, uh, on a Mac system on your local uh, laptop. The second was run on Amazon Linux machine. And thirdly, it was done with something what we are, we are going to talk about, like a workflow manager called Nextflow. You can see that most of the times, whatever results which came, and I, I want to go back a step and say that, okay, the results were for annotating a newly assembled genome. So it was about a, a number of genes are annotated. So what you can see is most of the genes are commonly found by all the three different methods, by the same pipeline, same tools, but different operating systems. But there is always going to be those specific ones. And think about a scenario wherein you actually would miss on the genes which you want to look at. That would not be good. There have been reasons which were uh, talked about why this could happen. So if you look at the pipeline being run on a Mac machine and the Amazon machine, you can see that on the Mac machine, one of the genes were identified, but with a shorter uh, open reading frame wherein the starting point was different. And that was counted as a different gene out here. However, when you run the same pipeline by putting inside a workflow manager like Nextflow, irrespective of whether you run it on a Mac or Amazon, it would give you exactly the same results because everything inside remains the same. Uh, something similar was done for a different experiment using for differential expression analysis, where it becomes very crucial that you get the same set of genes possible with at least the same pipeline. And you can see there are still some specificities for uh, depending upon where you run the pipeline. So 74 genes were found only uh, for native Amazon Linux machine, while 64 for Mac OS X, and most of them were common. However, if you run the same pipeline using a Nextflow, there is a perfect overlap, irrespective of whether you run the pipeline on Amazon or a Mac one. So these are the points which were identified to uh, for people to get encouraged for using something called workflow managers. So what is a workflow man a management system? Uh, the workflow managers provide a framework to coordinate and manage the execution of commands. Made those commands, and when I say commands, they are already developed pipelines possibly in Bash, Python, Perl, or any other language. 
they simplify the design and execution of workflows. Now I need to put a caveat here. When you talk about simplification of the design and execution, we are talking about running the pipeline and not developing one. When it comes to developing a new pipeline or modifying something in Nextflow, of course, there is a bit of a learning curve. Uh, yes, uh, the workflow managers can also implement efficient software management. So something called containers, which I will be touch touching upon, and they can solve issues pertaining to software installations and execution. So uh, we don't need to really bother about the softwares to be installed every time we move on to a different system or at a different time. So what containers basically are, are they are packaged kind of environments wherein what, say for example, you require 10 different softwares for 10 or 15 different processes in a pipeline. You just package them inside something called a container. And then you use that container everywhere you go with your next flow pipeline. And that's it. You don't, need, don't really need to bother about anything to do with the installation. So what the, the, the selling feature of a workflow management system would be that researcher can focus on the functionality of the pipeline and forget about everything else around. That is the dream goal. Nextflow, what we are going to talk about today is not the only workflow manager. There are quite a few other ones developed like Snakemake, Galaxy. I, I'm sure quite a few of you would have had a chance to work with Galaxy, which is more like a front end, but I think it also has a command line interface available now. And there are quite a few others, which I, even I'm not really acquainted with, and they keep coming in with all the different features. So why Nextflow? Why, why do we pick Nextflow out of all the uh, different options available? Uh, Nextflow is very popular in the research community. It is open source. It has got a very active developer community. So every time you have got any problems, you can just go on the blogs and ask a question. And I've seen that the response is very quick and effective. It has something called NF Core, which is a set of uh, pre-developed but customizable bioinformatic pipelines. So think about it. You're working in bioinformatics and there are so many questions asked like 10 or 15 ones, which are commonly and repetitively asked for different experiments like whole genome sequencing, whole exome sequencing, RNA-seq, for example. And if there is a pipeline already available, why do you want to reinvent the wheel and develop your own? You can just go to NF Core, pick up your pipeline. The good part is if you feel uh, one of the tools, one or many of the tools are missing in those pipelines, which you feel are of importance for your analysis, you can actually plug them inside and uh, modify your pipelines for yourself. Uh, there is also something called Nextflow Tower, which provides a point and click web interface. So you don't even need to worry more about command line interface if you're not really familiar with it. And then we can just run the pipelines which are available uh, in Nextflow, uh, specifically NFCO. And as I said, uh, Nextflow can be used for developers to build custom workflows. And that's where uh, Sarah Bicroft will be talking about it in the later half of the webinar. So what are the desirable features of Nextflow? Uh, First is, uh, yes, of course, we talked about this, reproducibility. If analysis is repeated, uh, are the outcomes the same? Uh, they are, the, are they the same for the, in the future on any other system that is a portability by other people in collaboration? That's very important. The second part, which is of very import, a big importance and which I've actually encountered myself is uh, the provenance part, where you should be able to track your data and tool versions. Why the data? In bioinformatics especially, what happens is, uh, there are a lot of updations in the database. So if you're working with a particular genome, human genome, every six months there's a new version popping up. And if, for example, think about it, you're working on a specific gene and you're talked about the gene to be uh, a novel gene and you put that in your results. And if you are getting your manuscript reviewed after six to eight months of it, and there's already a bigger version coming, a better version coming of the human genome, that gene might already be annotated, defined. And the reviewer might come back to you saying, okay, the gene is there, what are you talking about? You can always say that, okay, we are, we are sticking to that particular version of the human genome and get away with it, possibly. With the tool versions, yes, the tools would have newer functionalities always popping up. So you also want to keep track of uh, the, the, the version of the tools. Second, the scalability. Uh, normally speaking, how you do with experiments is you actually start small. You start with a pilot, uh, a pilot number of samples, which could be uh, in numbers uh, like three or four or six, whatever. And then you develop a pipeline for analyzing those. And they, that particular pipeline might work seamlessly on your laptop, for example. Like uh, if you want to run a rna experiment with few samples, everything runs very fine, for, even for mapping to some extent. But then when you want to scale it up for the actual uh, number of samples, which could be in, in tens or hundreds, the hardware requirements increase by hundreds of uh, orders of magnitude. And you need to ramp up from your local machine to your high-end processor. And that's where Nextflow processors, Nextflow pipelines, the workflow management systems come very handy. Very, They don't make you do almost anything but to change things in your configuration file, saying you need more resources. The pipeline functionality remains the same. The code remains the same. But everything around can be actually adjusted very easily. Productivity. 
you can run the same pipeline on different computer computing infrastructures example your local machine high performance computer commercial cloud so productivity need not be only regarding the scalability part uh, wherein you don't you might sometimes not want to scale your uh, uh, workflow for bigger number of samples it is also about what is available to you at the moment so at one point of time say six months before you had a particular resource available and you had run your pipeline there but after six months suddenly you are working in a different uh, job and you want to run the same pipeline on a different high performance computer you don't need to think too much about how you are going to do that you can just change a few parameters in your next flow config file and you can start running the same pipeline very efficiently is it possible to reduce installation deployment time? Of course, because you are already using something called the containers, which has got all the softwares packaged. And yes, that leads to uh, improvement in the deployment time. Uh, uh, Nextflow is easier to maintain, modify, and reuse. Uh, this all can be done in a very cumbersome way using plain scripting languages, because people have been doing it, trying to check if everything is going wrong, error correction, and all that in Bash. But Nextflow makes it much easier. Other interesting Nextflow features are checkpointing. And this is something which I found very, very exciting and uh, useful when I was working with bioinformatic pipelines. Because first reason is they come with really big amount of uh, uh, data sets, big, uh, large size data sets with large number of samples. Think about that you are trying to run, and I actually ran, uh, was working with the genome assembly of a koala genome six months or three, three years back or something in my previous job. And uh, one of my colleagues who was primarily working on the assembly, she started the run and after one week's time, and it took one week for her to get the run crash. And that time, because it was all in bash, she couldn't do anything else but restart the analysis. So that is a lot of time, resources, efforts wasted. Uh, what Nextflow can do for you is there is a simple command called resume, which helps you to cache what is already done and then uh, restart from uh, that particular point. Reporting is very easy and very interestingly put in Nextflow, where we can generate lots of plots with the uh, uh, such as workflow timeline, generate compute usage plot, and we'll look at a few of them at the end of my uh, presentation. And of course, we have NF Core and we have got Nextflow Tower, which I talked about. So NF Core in details, it is a repository of community developed, supported, maintained Nextflow pipelines. Almost 70 of them, 69 plus, are currently available, and most of them are bioinformatics ones. The good part of them is not only can you use them, you can customize them. You can develop on them to get in and out of most of your tools inside and just change the different parameters. So it's very, very, very useful. Uh, what does Nextflow generally do? Uh, it just converts many steps into a single command where you can run the default parameters plus more using just one single step. So what you can see on the left-hand side is all those different tools which are uh, required to be run in the RNSSEQ pipeline. And then you can actually run it only using a single command using uh, all the mandatory uh, parameters required, giving an output directory name, using the genome of interest, and then using something called profile. And we talked about this. The profile is nothing but the container. But in the container, we'll have all the softwares required for this particular pipeline to run seamlessly. So we can just carry our container with us and make Nextflow work on any platform, anywhere, anytime, for any user. So just trying to correlate what we looked at in the beginning. We looked at um, the very uh, simplistic looking block flow chart wherein we have all these, all these steps. And then we are looking at, on the right hand side, right, the same pipeline, which is developed by NFCO called NFCO RNSSeq. And we can place all these individual stages, as we call them in NFCO RNSSeq, in different uh, boxes. And you can see uh, the whole, uh, the, the figure is developed on something like a, a train station, when you can see there are multiple paths. Some of the paths have got the, st the different stations which are common across it, and then you can take a detour. We can just go this way, you can go the orange way, and we can go the, uh, the pink way, for example. And that sort of says that for doing the same kind of analysis, uh, Nextflow allows you to use different paths using different uh, processes, different uh, tools, which can do things slightly differently. I can give you an example. It's not only about the choice of tools which you have heard from your peers that you want to use. It's also based on what you have as availability in terms of the resource or what is the requirement. So I can give you an example around the STAR and the HiSat2 tools. HiSat2 came first. It is still a very good tool. STAR came afterwards. It does a lot of good job and it is a, uh, it's one of the most uh, uh, famous in the market, I can say, for reasons that it just uh, seems to do things more accurately. However, doing so, it requires a lot of uh, much more resources than in terms of CPUs and um, especially memory resources as compared to HiSat2. 
So think about a scenario when you are going to work on a, a HPC or a high performance computer, where you don't have so many resources at, at your disposal. Even though you want to use star, you cannot use it. I said do to does the job in a very efficient way with much lesser resources. But if you want to go for the best, what is accepted by the community as the best, you might want to go with star. The third option is with salmon, for example. Think about this is the path you want to go and do all these different things and reach a place where you you actually get the quality check of the outputs and get the final file. Salmon can do so in very quick time by doing something called instead of alignment, it can do something called pseudo alignment. And when I say pseudo, it sort of reflects into the amount of time taken for processing. So if you have got too many samples, like hundreds and thousands of samples, for example, and you don't really require all these intermediate files, you can just use Salmon. You can just use Salmon and get the same output count matrix file instead of going all the way. So there are different ways. Now think about it. There is going to be a tool in the future which pops in. Possibly the NFCO RNSSEQ team will be proactive to put inside. But if not, you can develop yourself and try to get the pipeline customized for your own benefit and make, maybe put a version in NFCO. That also is possible. Next, we come to uh, the useful uh, output logs from Nextflow. Uh, well, first is the timeline log. As you can see on the y-axis, you can see the different processes which are running. And if you see the numbers one and two, these are the same processes which are marked by the same color for different samples. So what it says is when does the particular, and on the x-axis, we do have the timeline in minutes, for example, here. We can see uh, easily see uh, in the output timeline plot, when does a particular process start? When does it end? You can see that some of the processes need to wait for the previous uh, process to stop and start and then proceed. Now it also says that if you have uh, appreciable resources available, multiple samples can run in parallel. If, they, if you don't, even these samples need, should, cannot run in parallel and they will wait for each other based on what is available. It's also seen that for more complicated uh, uh, pipelines, we can see that after a particular step, all the samples at a particular stage of their processing need to come together. So there are all these things actually taken care of. What, what, what are the different steps at which what process need to start, what for what it needs to stop, and all that is actually uh, taken care of by Nextflow. Uh, it also helps us to look at what is the usage in terms of, say, CPU. In this case, we can see that one of the processes like quantification requires much more CPUs as compared to the rest of them. How does it help? It not only helps us to look at what happened, but it can also, also help us to plan the bigger future, uh, bigger experiments with a lot more samples. So we can actually assign only those number of CPUs which are required for that particular process, if possible. We don't need to really uh, waste the resources if a particular process like this one index, I can see that it might not be able to use more than one CPU. So why to, uh, why to assign it more than one CPU? Just can get away from there and try to do the same thing for the other ones. Similarly for the memory, uh, as you can see, and I just talked about Star Aligner takes a lot of memory. So that's the one which actually uses like 30 gigs of memory for whatever amount of time. And the rest of them don't use so much. So we can concentrate our efforts on putting more memory resources into star and then uh, try to optimize things. All that can be done by using a, a file or a group of files which are called the Nextflow config files. So when the pipeline script starts, Nextflow looks for this configuration file. It can, it's a very simple text file containing a set of properties defined in, in terms of name and value. So like I said before, you can assign a uh, number of CPUs as and when you require it, the number of CPUs assignment or memory assignment can be specific to a process or it can be assigned for the whole pipeline as such. Uh, likewise, we can do it for quite a few different things. Also, we can use uh, the containers. So we talked about containers. There are uh, there are package softwares. So if you want have a particular container, we can just define that container or the path of the container inside the Nextflow config and use it in the pipeline. Uh, the resume function, we can keep it True by default, I don't see any scenario why people would not want to do that, but that's that's what I wanted to show. Likewise, you can create all the different log files uh, what are created. Now, one thing we, I want to uh, emphasize on is, if at all we have put in a few parameters in the config file, we can always override those parameters when we try to run, when we run the command at the command line. So no need to worry if some things are by default, we can always have our say. Just to uh, slightly summarize how the workflow manager works. So Nextflow, and similarly, SnakeMake would work in a slightly different way, but the whole, whole thing is about workflow managers is they try to uh, help us in scalability, portability, reproducibility, and parallelization. While doing so, they use uh, containers for running these particular workflow management systems. So we can carry the containers and 
for and this other thing which we haven't discussed is executors wherein say for example we are running our pipeline on a particular high processing computer or a amazon machine uh, these require some specific kind of executors where, which are different in the architecture. So some, some of them would work with PBS, some of them would work with Slurm, and all that is also customizable in NextFlow. So the same pipeline, if you want to alternately work on PBS, we can give us it as a parameter saying if you work on a particular system, it works with PBS, work, use PBS. If not, work with Slurm. So just to conclude my part, uh, what we have done is trying to see how we can next flow the workflow. We have gone from a very simplistic looking uh, block uh, workflow diagram on the left hand side to show how complicated it can be. But however complicated it is, we can try to use workflow management systems like next flow and use a single command, but which is very flexible. So it need not be only these default parameters. We can customize them to whatever extent and also customize them in terms of adding or subtracting additional tools by doing some kind of development and get a very good looking linear kind of output in uh, folders or folders, good hierarchy. So we can actually have a look at outputs. Now, when I talk about trying to customize these workflows, that is what uh, Sarah Beecroft is going to talk about. So I will uh, stop here and I will give the rest to Sarah. Okay, uh, hopefully uh, that's all good. Please, Melissa, unmute and tell me if it is not. Um, so I'm Sarah and I'll be taking a slightly different um, angle on Nextflow. So talking a little bit more about what's under the hood um, and um, like if you have a Nextflow, co Nextflow core pipeline that maybe you want to alter, um, what are some steps you could take to maybe do that? So what's in this section? Uh, I'm going to step you through some of the Nextflow jargon. They have some specific uh, keywords that um, we'll go through. Uh, also looking at a bash pipeline that is translated into Nextflow, you, so you can compare side by side. Uh, talk a little bit more about what is this main.nf file and what is uh, nextflow.config. Uh, and Nimbus, which is Pawsey's cloud um, compute. Um, so when, why, and how would you use that? Okay, so Nextflow jargon. So on top here, I have um, a, an example bioinformatics workflow. So the top gray box uh, is some input data, maybe you know some fastq files or something, and we do a bunch of steps to those files. So it all might merge in QC, trim in QC, excuse me, doing some assembly, mapping contigs, doing some alignment, and then getting a final output, which is the thing that we want to to analyze at the end. You know, like um, that's the part that we're interested in. Um, and then underneath, I've replaced those specific um, like I've replaced those words with um, the next flow jargon. So you can see how that maps to a real pipeline. Well, an example pipeline, I suppose. Um, so some specific terms, input data would be the data that you um, starting off with. So maybe your fastq files. Um, so a process or job step would be each of these little blue jobs that we've got here. So one job step would be assembly. Another job step would be mapping contigs, for example. And so each of these job steps um, creates some small files, typically. Um, and so we call these intermediate files if you haven't come across that word before. So for example, the map contigs step creates this intermediate file um, some create some intermediate files like contigs, Blast creates some RefSeq intermediate files, which then get put into another job step. Um, and the way that these intermediate files get um, sent from one job step to another job step to another job step is called data channels. And so this is a way of specifying to Nextflow, okay, I have this intermediate file and I want you to do this with it and then I want you to do this other thing with it. Um, yeah, so it's just kind of like a, a fancy way of piping your files. Uh, and then the final output uh, is like the, the thing that you actually want to keep, the whole reason for you doing this pipeline. So maybe that's like a VCF file or a BAM file or whatever it is. Okay, so let's have a look um, at a bash script. So um, just to uh, talk through this one. Um, so at the top of this bash script, um, 
I've set some variable names. So I've told it, uh, what is the name of my input data? What is the name of my reference database for BLAST? And then um, I have two processes or job steps in this script. So process one is running the BLAST search. Um, so I'm calling, I'm calling on BLAST to um, do the thing that it does and calling on these variables that I've set up top here. So this is um, creating BLAST underscore result and also creating top underscore hits dot text. Then I have a second process using a different BLAST function. Um, and this second process is also using this top hits dot text that I created in the previous step and creating the sequences.txt file. Um, so I hope you can see this and it's not too small. Um, so in to compare that with Nextflow, so this is the same bash script. So setting the variable names rather than um, having the input data equals sample name, I have params.input data sample name and params.ref database. Um, so it's some different syntax or um, different jargon, but setting the same thing. Um, then I also uh, set up this data channel um, to tell Nextflow I want to move this. Um, I want to I want to feed in the input data uh, is what this is saying, and I want to feed in um, the reference database into my process or job step, uh, which is blast search. So this is. This chunk here, process blast search in the brackets, that chunk is the same as process one in the bash script. So I'm telling it my input is the input, um, like the fast, the faster file. I'm telling it the output that I want is this top hits.txt that we spoke about. And then I'm telling it the same command that I want to run. It's actually word for word, basically the same. Then I have my second process. Um, and then I'm telling it, I want to have this top hits file um, from the previous process. And the output I'm expecting is this sequences.txt, which we could see also in the bash script. And then running the shell, running the command exactly like it was in the bash script. Um, so you can see how what you might already be familiar with, the bash script um, is kind of morphed and padded out um, in this particular way to turn it into a Nextflow file. And so this is um, the main.nf file. So as a convention, um, these are always called main.nf. Um, and this is where all of the commands live uh, for the pipeline that you want to run. Um, so the main.nf is one of the two key files for any Nextflow workflow. Um, so main.nf has the what, so the commands, the pipeline flow, like the order um, and the parameters. So um, for things like what input data you want to put in and stuff like that. And the config file, which Nandan also kind of talked about um, is the how, so which software do you want to use and like what settings do you want to have? So let's talk a bit more about this. So what can you set in the config file? Um, as Nandan said, you can resume from where the pipeline crashed, which is very, very handy, um, particularly if you're um, running like a, lo a long job or jobs or like um, a long pipeline or pipelines with lots of different steps. Um, you can also choose which software to use. So you can specify if you want to use Conda, if you want to use containers, which versions of things you want to use. Um, you can also specify like CPU or memory usage for each job step, um, and this can um, you can also say, if I'm running on Nimbus, I want to use this much memory for this job step. If I'm running on Satonix, which is a supercomputer, I want to use this much memory for this job step, which is really handy. So you can um, specify all of this in the config file. Um, if you are using containers, you can set up your singularity or Docker options, um, things for logging and lots of other things. Um, so I won't go into too much detail here because the idea is to give you kind of a scaffolding for um, doing your own learning. You won't walk away from this being able to write your own Nextflow pipelines just yet, but I'm sure you'll get there very soon. Okay, so then uh, let's talk a bit about Nimbus. Um, so as I said, Nimbus is Pawsey's uh, cloud computing facility. 
So if you're an Australian researcher or scientist, uh, there is no charge for you to use Nimbus, um, which, is, which is really handy. Um, so it, one way to think about what is cloud computing, it's like getting your own free DIY server. Um, so if you're like, oh, okay, I need a Linux machine to, to run some things, but I don't have budget to buy um, a, a beefy actual box, uh, an actual physical machine, what you can do is instead have one in the cloud, which you access remotely. Um, that's what Nimbus is. Um, so we have both CPU and GPU available. Um, the GPUs get booked out pretty quickly, um, but they are there. Um, you also have pseudo access. So this means that you are the admin. You can install whatever you want. Um, you can configure things how you like. Um, uh, it runs on a Linux operating system. It doesn't support Windows, it's just Linux. Um, and although you are in control of your uh, little server, uh, you can still access advice and like solution design from Pawsey experts. So if you have any questions at all, um, lodge a ticket with the help desk and we will help you. So we have a number of different um, size servers um, or another term for that is virtual machine um, available to you. Um, so uh, starting from uh, one core with four gigs of RAM all the way up to 16 cores and 64 gigs of RAM. Um, and you can have more than one server in your allocation. So you might wonder, when should I be using Nimbus? Um, like what, what, you know, when is that useful for me? Um, well, Nimbus is good if you need quick access to compute because the turnaround time for getting onto the machine is um, somewhere about a week usually, um, sometimes less. Um, it's good if you don't need a huge amount of compute. So if you're not ready for a supercomputer, if you need less than 100 cores, um, then Nimbus is, is well suited. Um, it's also good if you have jobs that maybe run for a really long time. So some researchers have things that um, run for literally like more than a week at a time and that's just one job step. Um, and so those type of jobs aren't very well suited to the supercomputer because we have a hard wall time of 96 hours, which means that your job will get killed after 96 hours. Um, so Nimbus is good for those sorts of use cases. Uh, maybe also you're getting started. Uh, you're learning bioinformatics or uh, you wanna test out a workflow or whatever, um, and you're not quite ready for high performance computing like Zotonix, um, then Nimbus is really useful. It's also good if you want to use interactive tools like Jupyter Notebooks or um, RStudio. Uh, we have those set up on Nimbus. And which leads me to the next point about special features for bioinformatics users. Um, so we have this special Nimbus bio image, which is designed to make life easier for bioinformatics users. Um, so it comes with some pre-installed software such as Nextflow, Singularity, Docker, Pip, Python, R, uh, and I think also SnakeMake. Um, we also have nice instructions for running R Studio and Jupyter Notebook, so that's, that's actually really handy. We also have a lot of common dependencies installed, so if you're doing um, some installations of some, of some software, you're less likely to run into um, this dependency isn't installed, please go and install it, and spending a couple of hours figuring all that out um, and installing all the things. Uh, we also have um, CERN VMFS, which is a read-only file system for accessing uh, reference data sets. Um, so currently, uh, this is mirroring the Galaxy Australia uh, repo. So there's a lot of um, interesting and useful things on there. Um, so it, when you want to apply for Nimbus, um, it's actually, this is the entire form. Um, it's very short, so it's basically like a one-pager. Um, so you just give like a kind of a paragraph about what you'll be using it for, what resources would you like, what institution are you at, um, and our team will look at it and um, either approve it or get back to you. Um, um, you know, we can have a conversation. Okay, so those are some references and we can put, um, share more useful training materials, uh, links um, to this audience or in the description. Uh, yeah, so thanks very much. Uh, I think we're open for questions.
Yes, thanks so much, Nandan and Sarah. We are now open for questions. Uh, perhaps I can start with a question. We, you mentioned earlier that there are 69 NF core workflows. Can you tell us a little bit more about what type of workflows they are and the type of analysis that they cater for? So, uh, yes, like I said, most of the common bioinformatics uh, questions which are asked have been already answered using making workflows. I'm lo just looking at them on the side and I can see workflows for, I'm used a workflow for whole uh, ex uh, exome sequencing. Uh, there's a workflow for metagenomics like AmpliSeq, for example. Uh, there are workflows for analyzing viral uh, DNAs, RNA fusion. There is a workflow for small uh, RNA-seq as well. And I think there should be a workflow for single RNA-seq as well, uh, single cell RNA-seq. So if, if you look at a list out there, do you want me to share the list? That would be easy, right? Tracy has just shared a link to okay, okay. the, that, the that website into the chat. So it's just that when you go, there's a there's a workflow which I didn't really expect uh, for dual RNA seq. So there are cases when we can actually uh, sequence the RNAs from the host and the parasite uh, together. So even that is actually uh, put in there. So quite a few specific ones, and yeah, there's a workflow for chip seq, for example. So most of the questions which we normally do are actually already there. The thing is, it all depends upon uh, whether they have been updated, uh, whether the latest tools are already available. I do not know. But because of the customizable nature of it, we can actually work with them and try to put in more, if at all. That's what my take is. Anything more, Sarah? Yeah, I would agree with that. Even if you don't have the specific workflow on there, um, they can still be useful as a base. Um, and also a lot of the tools um, transfer between different um, pipelines. So for example, BWA or STAR, uh, you could probably take out a chunk from one of the NF core pipelines and put it into something that you are maybe writing. Yeah. I mean, one of my experiences, just to add on to that is we are working with, uh, we start, I started working at SIH and I had to work with a workflow called AmpliSeq for metagenomics for, and then we didn't have a particular functionality and we had to uh, go back to scratch and just do it ad hoc. By the time I finished the analysis, somebody had already updated that functionality into NF core. So if I'd have joined an SI six months later, I would have spent, uh, we have saved a lot of time in developing that. So it's always good to go back to NFCO and figure out if people are in the development stage or not, which we did, but we didn't have the time for waiting. Yeah. Sounds like there's a few different options in there already. We'll turn now to the questions from the audience. And the first question we have is, how do you get big data into Nimbus? Can it also access pausey data? Yeah, so um, with the capital refresh, Pawsey's um, changed a, or updated a lot of its hardware and services. Um, so we have this S3 storage option called Acacia now. And so Acacia, um, it's a bit like an Amazon bucket, so you can access it from anywhere um, and you use it to store your data for the lifetime, <coughs> excuse me, of your Pawsey project. So um, you can either um, so this means that you can access it from anywhere within Pawsey as well. So um, if you wanted to put something onto Acacia from your like local machine, you can then pull it down on the supercomputer or you can pull it down on Nimbus um, and it's really quick. Um, you can also, if you want to upload data to Nimbus in like the more traditional old school way, you can use um, SCP uh, or rsync or something like that. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, the next question we have is again about using Nextflow on Nimbus and it's about how do you install Nextflow in an existing Nimbus virtual machine and whether the Nextflow pipelines are available after you do that Nextflow installation. Yeah, so if you, um, uh, I guess if you're starting up a new VM, you can use the bio image, which makes it easy. If you've already got a VM and didn't use the bio image, um, then it's pretty easy to install Nextflow. Um, because you have admin privileges, you um, can install basically anything. Um, so the Nextflow team would have instructions on how to do that. Um, there's probably a few different ways. Um, and then um, if you want to use a particular pipeline, you can download it um, either using the nfcore command um, or like from GitHub. Uh, so yeah, once you have Nextflow installed, the world is your oyster, so to speak. Excellent, thank you. I'll go back to another question that I had. Uh, we, 
you mentioned that it's sometimes difficult to know whether the tools are up to date in the NF core workflows. What's the best way to, to check that and to figure out who's maintaining it and how to contribute to those as well? Mm, Sarah, do you have a better answer for that? Because I, I <laughs> yeah, because yeah, there could be, there should be a way somewhere like looking at the versions, but I, I don't know. Do you have an answer for that? Yeah, it tends to be on their GitHub. So if you yeah. go to the NF core page, uh, you can like get an overview of all the different workflows mm -hmm. and then you can click through to um, the GitHub uh, where it has like more specific information. You can view all of the files. Um, you can create pull requests as well. Um, yeah, so then you can kind of get into the guts of it and see how recently it's been updated as well. So one thing with the NF core pipelines is some of them, um, yeah, haven't been updated for a long time. So they're kind of like ghost pipelines, I guess, in that sense. Um, yeah, so it just depends. Yeah, I, I think it's a good good thing to know because I learned it the hard way. I sort of once used a tool which was of a different version and I formatted one database and then I had to go back and check this. So yeah, it's a good good thing to first look at the versions for by going to the places where Sarah has mentioned. So, thanks, I mean, Sarah. there's also provenance information from like the actual pipeline that you run, but I personally prefer, so you can get that information when you run the workflow as well. I personally prefer having a squiz on the GitHub first. Sure. Thank you, that sounds like good advice. Okay, so it looks like we will leave it there for today. Uh, I just have a few things to share with you before we leave. So just one moment, please. So firstly, Thank you so much to Sarah and Nandan for sharing your time and your expertise with us today. It's been really interesting to hear about the different options that are available for accessing and running NF Core and NextFlow workflows on Nimbus. The next webinar that we have coming up is also about workflows, but a slightly different flavor of them. And we'll be looking at how you can use Galaxy Australia to recreate bioinformatics methods and workflows on that system as well. That work webinar is taking place on the 26th of October at 1 p.m. and the details are now up on the Australian BioCommons website, along with information about all of the other events we have coming up as well. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge the Australian BioCommons funding. We are enabled by NCRIS funding by BioPlatforms Australia. So thank you again, Sarah and Nandan, and to the team in the background as well. And thank you to all of, all of you for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed the webinar and we hope to see you again soon. Until then, enjoy the rest of your day and goodbye for now.